Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. So good morning and welcome to Summerside Community Church. To everybody both in our house, in this morning, again, if you're in the lobby, come on in. And to those joining virtually on Facebook and YouTube. So welcome to each and every one of you guys. Uh, we're really happy that you're here. It's really nice to be up here and see everybody's faces. Great. Um, this is going to be a great morning. I just know it. So I know everybody has your own responsibilities and routines during the week, but it really feels good to come in and come back week after week and see our familiar faces. It just feels like home. Um, sometimes you walk in and it almost feels like a family reunion, right? Like you see some people you want to beeline and give them a hug. You see some people you know they're good with a high five. You see some people like the quirky like uncles and aunts and you maybe want to steer it another way and that's okay, right? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why Jack is turning around and looking at people, but it does feel great to uh, belong to Summerside Community Church. Wonderful. So my name is Audrey. I'm your host this morning just to help navigate us through the day. Um, and my husband Jason and I have been calling Summerside Community Church our home for about 15 years, so it's great to be here. I invite you guys, before our worship team gets started, to stand up, stretch a little bit, and I really challenge you to um, take a look around the room and introduce you, yourself to somebody you don't know, or somebody that you know and you forget their name. So I was a kindergarten, my daughter's like laughing at me, right? I was a, I was a kindergarten teacher for a long time. It's, I've always tried to remember people's names. I find it so important. And, you know, I can see somebody week after week, and then I feel like I should know their name, and I don't know their name, and I feel bad. This is a time where you say, I'm really, you know, I'm having a brain fart. You know, my name is Audrey. Is it Chris or Crystal? What do you prefer? Whatever, right? So stand up, greet each other, find out somebody's name, and we'll get back with our worship. It's a friendly bunch of people. <laughs> Can I ask you to let's turn our hearts to the Lord this morning. Father, thank you for the joy that's in this house. Thank you for the love that's in this house. Father, we turn our hearts and our affections towards you this morning. You are the reason that we're here. Father, I pray that when we leave here this morning that we will have a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation of who you are. The holiness that you withhold, that you hold. Jesus, we want to know you more. That's the cry of my heart this week, that I would know you more. I could spend a lifetime with you and there would still be more to know. So worthy of our praise, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. You're worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath. 
Show me who 
this morning to not wait for a feeling to worship him because of who he is and if he showed up here today in the flesh to ask yourself what would I do what would my worship look like because he is here here and he's calling us to worship him in spirit and in truth for who he is, for what he's done. We just came through a season of celebrating the whole reason that we know who Jesus is. So Father, take us deeper into your presence. Show us, Lord. Show us worship in spirit and in truth. Help us to be Mary who poured out oil at your feet. Oh, oh we worship you, Jesus. We make room for you in this house. Oh, less of us and more.
Fill those parts. 
We wait on you this morning, Lord. You are so good to us. The presence of your sweet spirit, indwelling love that we all get to taste and see today. We're so grateful. We're so thankful. We take our cares to you, Lord. We take those things, Lord, to you that are 
deep within our heart. And you walk with us. And you hold us. And you carry us. And you never leave us. And we thank you, Lord, in this season of post Resurrection Sunday, where you spent 40 days walking in Israel and meeting with the ones you had taught. You imparted more love. And you fulfilled your word that you would rise from the dead. And you gave evidence to hundreds. And that gives us hope for today. So we rest in you. Amen. 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 Well, this week, um, Tracy asked me to share the communion thought, and um, so I meet regularly with a couple of buddies, and so I, I let them know that I was going to be uh, sharing the communion thought, and I, I gave them my theme and asked them for some ideas, and they gave me some great ideas, and so I went home all pumped up with these great ideas, and, and uh, then it was on, uh, I guess, Friday night. Shirley said to me, how come you're, you're working so hard on this communion thought? Like, what's, what's up with that? And uh, I thought, I think maybe that the Lord speaks through my wife occasionally. <laughs> And so her question triggered a a prayer, and like I was, I was I had a really good thought. <laughs> I had a really good thought, and my buddies really added some really good thoughts to it. But her her question triggered a prayer, and I said, "Jesus, is this the communion thought that you want me to share?" And um, Guess what? The heavens were silent. And um, do you know how hard it is to press delete on something that you've prepared? You know, just to, where you, you start the whole thing and you, you go through the whole thing and it comes up in yellow and then you, and then you look at it a second time and then you press delete and poof, you've got this white page just staring at you. Um, more of you, less of me. Surrender. I think one of my biggest sins is confession time. It's amazing how quiet the room gets. Is simply that I do first, and, and then I ask the Holy Spirit later. That's just been the pattern of my life. I don't know whether it's because I'm an oldest child, or whether I'm type A, or I, I mean, I've had therapy for this for a long time. I've been a Christian for 46 years, and I still struggle with doing things on my own without asking God. And I heard this podcast this week by Dr. Uh, Dan Allender, who's a Christian psychiatrist, or psychologist, I should say, and he said, good leaders and good marriage partners and good friends uh, will do three things in your life. They will be with you, they will be for you, and they will be against you. 
And I thought about Shirley and her question to me on Friday night, why are you working so hard on this? At that particular time. See, with you is that they see you. They see you. They know you. They're with you. They see you. For you is that they cheer you on. And against you is they correct you. They know you well enough that when things aren't going quite towards the North, North Star, they, they need to correct you. It's all about presence. So Friday, I asked the Lord, so what do you want me to share? And he asked me to take uh, back, he it took me back to, to my whole week, and it was a, it was some, I had some beautiful time with the Lord. And he took me back to last Saturday morning to the, the breakfast that the, the men had on Easter weekend. And I was standing in line uh, waiting to uh, load my plate. By the way, guys, second Saturday of the month, I think Dr. Hank Visitor is speaking in May. Um, it's, it's just a great time for guys to get together. So I'm standing in line. And I'm standing behind this guy who's just got back from uh, Bethel Conference. And I said to him, what's your biggest takeaway? And this was his answer, two words. He said, being seen. Being seen. The presence of God, he said, just being seen for who I am and being loved in being seen. And I thought, whoa, I'm going to use that. Guess what we have today? The opportunity to be seen. I've already shared with you a little bit of my week, and I've, I've tried to let you into being seen, into who I am and who I struggle with, and just trying to be real. So what is the greatest gift that we can give to each other? What is the greatest gift that Jesus gave to us? I, I don't think it was the miracles or the signs and wonders. Those were fantastic, and they validated who he was. I think it was the fact that he walked with us and he could see us and he loved us. When I watch that program, The Chosen, and I look at the way he treats people, the way he sees them, the way he stops for them, I just, I weep. Mm -hmm. There isn't one of those episodes that I haven't just wept the way he sees you and knows you and loves you, being seen. Focused listening, attentiveness to what God is doing. So we're living in these 40 days of post-resurrection Sunday, and Jesus is recorded at least 10 times in Scripture as being with people for over those 40 days. And I just want to read you a couple of them really quickly, and then I'll close and we'll take communion together. Mary Magdalene, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. He called her by name, he saw her. He was with her. He was with a woman who had had a previous life that, and she was the first one that, and she was the first one to declare the gospel. He was with her. And then there was the two ro uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, and, and they're walking along, and he 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 says, they say to him, are you the only one who hasn't heard? And and then he starts to explain everything from the prophets and, and they, they get to his house and they're having this great visit and they invite him in and, 
then they, they break bread with them, and then their eyes are opened. And he saw them, and they saw him. And Then there's the 500 disciples in 1 Corinthians 15. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though a few have fallen asleep. And then he says to you today in Philippians, don't be anxious about anything because I see you. In everything and in prayer and in supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to me because my peace is with you which surpasses all understanding. And I'm going to guard your hearts and I'm going to guard your minds. I see you. Right now, I see where you're at. I see what you're carrying. I am with you. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Put your name in there. Cast your burden on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. And I'll finish with this one in Hebrews. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man possibly do to me? It's a beautiful picture of the vineyard. These emblems of wine and bread represent his blood and his body. And we consume him today. And as we're coming to receive these uh, emblems, um, you guys sang that second song that you sang this morning. Uh, while, while they're coming, uh, Jody, I think it was, you were leading it. Yeah, um, because there's something about the presence of God in that song, and that, that that song really spoke to me. And I think it'd be appropriate if we if we sang it while while everybody's coming up. And while you're coming up to receive the emblems, you take them back and hold on to them. We'll, we'll eat and drink together. And by the way, if you're here for the first time, oh, so good to see you. Um, half of you, as far as I'm concerned, are here for the first time because I don't know who you are. <laughs> Um, and I'm so glad to see you. Um, so I just wanted to say, if, if you're coming from another uh, church, if, if you've got even a uh, mustard seed of faith inside of you and come, coming from another church, you are so welcome to join us at this table. And um, so take the emblems back to your seat, and then I'll, I'll uh, lead us in a prayer. But while you're coming, uh, be conscious of seeing the people around you. And if you have, have something encouraging to say to them or uh, a word that you want to share with them or you, you don't, I loved what Audrey said at the beginning of our uh, time together. If I don't remember your name and I should remember your name, I want to know your name. That's okay to ask and, and, and uh, give some hugs and, and just interact rather than, you know, being in a grade two school line, you know, standing behind the next person and and just like interact with one another because we're family and let's let's be seen by one another let's be with one another this morning and uh, and let's stand right now and come on up and as we're either singing listening to them sing or as we're welcoming each other let's take these emblems back to our uh, seat together now come on up Be there. 
If everybody could just uh, remain standing, and before we uh, break bread together, we're going to sing this second verse together about his presence. Second and verse. You and me, pure and will in spirit. Take me back to where it all So we lift the body of Christ. We remember both him, we remember each other. We remember our elders who are away on retreat. We remember their spouses. We thank God for one another. We, we celebrate the fact that he invites us to his table because he sees us. He sees all of us and he loves. 
all of us so much more than we know. And so as we eat, we eat his love. Let's eat together. And we drink this fruit of the vine that represents his spilled blood shed for the cancellation, the remission of our sin once and for all. And we're reminded that his grace is boundless. And that though he sees us in all of our past and all of our future, uh, he loves us even more. Let's drink to him. Father, we bless you and thank you. And uh, we invite you to open our hearts right now as Colby comes up to open the word for us. We thank you, Father, for this uh, young man that you have raised in, uh, in our church family. And we're so grateful that uh, we can open our hearts now as we continue to experience. Uh, you're with us. You see us. And you're with Colby. And you see him. And so, so we open our hearts now to uh, the word you've given to him. Amen. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. I'm just going to have another drink because that cracker is really drying me out. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Colby. I'm the youth pastor I'm here at the church. And it's good to be with you. Jesus is alive. He's well. He's still moving in case you, didn't, in case you missed last week. And he's here with us right now. I'm going to get right in this morning. Uh, so we have lots of time. But if you're watching... Uh, this is just a side note. It's kind of like confession time, but it's more about just what I don't like. Um, I was watching myself last week on Facebook, and I noticed there's a bald spot forming. <laughs> and I'm upset that you people that you called my friends and family did not tell me about this. So I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna turn this way, so the camera catches the good side. All right. Anyways, there was a time in my life when I loved preaching more than I loved Jesus. Not just me preaching, but preachers in general. I was a preaching fanatic. I would watch a preacher preach and I would scan and I would care more about his delivery. I would care more about how he used his tones. I would care more about his sermon illustrations. I would care more about how he moved and used the stage. How he organized his sermon with his three points. I would watch for that and I would look for that. But eventually, only after beginning to read the Word of God, beginning to absorb it, beginning to eat the Word of God, did I notice that I began listening, I was listening to people talk about the gospel, but it was not the full gospel. It was the gospel that was kind of fluffy, but they knew how to say it pretty well. And I enjoyed that. And after I read this book, and after not caring and, and figuring out, you know, you know, even if they're a bad preacher, they might have something to say. I began to realize what we believe matters. What we listen to matters. And it matters because 
It is the lens that you view your world through. So if I'm believing something, that is how I will look at the world through. It is the lens. And I'm not saying that you have to agree with everything that is said in this pulpit. And I'm not even saying if you don't agree with it, you have to run out the door. But I'm saying that we need to be a church that learns how to think critically and not just be spoon-fed by people. We have a problem in the Western world, in the church of North America, that we don't actually read the book. We just let preachers tell us about it. We jumped right into it this morning. Friends, doctrine matters. What we believe matters. Because, like I said, it is the perspective on how you see the world. Why am I saying all this? I actually changed my message Friday night because I felt the Lord convict me so much about after watching um, a well-known preacher in the States talk about how he was questioning God's design of male and female. And that if it was up to him, he would change it. And then I watched the Easter production that they did. And I, my opinion, glorified the evil one and not our Savior. And friends, I'm not calling him anything because James 3 says that God will judge teachers more strictly in the end times. But what I'm saying is we need to be careful of who we listen to, who we glean information from, and we ultimately need to pick up this book and read it for ourselves because this book is the authority. This book stands alone in all matters of heaven and below. This book. So church, this morning I feel the Lord put on my heart to share what, you know, might be a difficult message, but I hope it will give us insight into the day, into the season that we are living in. And friends, sometimes when we talk about the Spirit, it's hard to find the Word. So that's why I love Scripture, because it gives us language, it gives us context. It gives us theological understanding. It gives us cultural understanding for the moment when we are living here on Prince Edward Island. And it's my hopes this morning that my sermon will help the church find its voice. So that we will become a church set up on a hill. That we won't be just like every other church that is, might be just doing the religious thing week in and week out, that we will actually fall in love with the person of Jesus Christ. That we would be a church that stands on the foundation of Scripture. That we would be a church that stands on the doctrine of our faith. And when we look into a world and we see a generation that is longing for the truth. And what they're f looking for and they're trying to find truth in drugs, in sex, in, in, in alcohol. And we can be a church that says, listen... We believe in the authority of the Bible, and we have the truth of the Bible. And the truth is that Jesus Christ loves you so much, that, he, that, that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins so that we can have eternal life. That is the truth. And ultimately, that's what the church is about, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to preach from you from my, ultimately my favorite book in all of Scripture. And I've said this before, it's the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible, and it's written by a man named the Apostle John, who is the second most prolific author in all of the New Testament after the Apostle Paul. And John writes the Gospel of John. He writes 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 
and he writes the book of Revelation. And the word Revelation translates out of the Greek word apocalypsis, which means the uncovering or the unveiling of a new reality. And sometimes when people talk about the book of Revelation, we might get confused and we might think of it, it's this weird book with monsters and dragons at Christmas time and just dr fire. It's, and it might be just so confusing. And people try to create graphs and they try to create timelines and formulas for when Christ is going to return. I love the book of Revelation, but my concern is sometimes we read it and we miss the point. Ultimately, the book of Revelation is about the unveiling of Jesus Christ to the church. That is the point of the book of Revelation. And really, it's a pastoral book that Jesus wrote through the Apostle John to the seven churches. Church, the interesting thing is John is the only one of the original 12 disciples that doesn't give his life up for the gospel. And it's not because John didn't try. And it's not because the Roman government didn't try to kill him. It's because John refused to die. And he, he, it was so much that the Roman government sent him to this small island of Patmos where he lived for 18 months. And in fact, he outlived the governor who sent him there. And then he ended up traveling back to Asia Minor to oversee the churches. The Bible says, while he was on the island on the Lord's day, he heard a voice from heaven. And it said, come up higher. Let me show you the things that are going to happen prior to my return. The book of Revelation, Jesus authors in the first kind of half, seven letters to the seven gateway churches in seven ancient cities. So if you have your Bible, we're going to look at Revelation 1, 9 to 11 to start. It's going to be on the screen here. It says, I, John... Your brother and companion in the suffering and the kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Let me read that again. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. And friends, if you want to travel to Turkey today, which someday I wish and hope I'll be able to do, you could take a tour and see the ancient ruins of these seven churches. And sometimes I think we forget that Jesus is actually speaking to real people. I think we forget that Jesus is actually speaking to real people living in real cities, going to real churches that are being pastored by real people. The main point that Jesus is trying to get through the book of Revelation is, is, is to the seven churches is this. I got some things I've not yet said, and you need to adopt them into your understanding, or you, get, you may run the risk of getting off track. Friends, Jesus is not asking John to solve all the mysteries that was left behind after the resurrection and he ascended into, into uh, heaven. Jesus is not asking John to um, make himself more appealing to culture. Jesus is not asking John, hey, John, do you mind taking out all the stuff about repentance and judgment um, just so I can be more acceptable? What Jesus is proclaiming through the Apostle John is this. This is who I am, and I need every church to know it. 
So church, let's jump in and take a look at one of the seven letters that Jesus authored through the Apostle John to one of the seven churches. I believe this letter has big um, things for us today. This letter we're going to look at, look at comes out of Revelation 2, 18 to 29. Jesus is writing to the church of Thyatira. And we don't know much about the, the background of Thyatira at the time, but we do know it was the center of worship for Apollo, who was called the God of Sunlight. And in fact, Apollo was thought to be of kind of the divine guardian of the city. And we know that Thyatira believed that the Roman emperor was the incarnation of Apollo. So in that city, both Apollo and Caesar were claimed to be sons of Zeus, the son of the most high God. So when we look at the first sentence in Jesus' letter to the church, it's not a surprise to us when he says, when he refers to himself as the son of God. It is actually the only place in the book of Revelation where he speaks of himself that way, or John speaks of himself, that, uh, of Jesus that way. So let's look what Jesus says to the church. Jesus says, I'm the one whose eyes burn like fire, and whose feet are like brass. I'm the one whose eyes burn like fire, and whose feet are like brass. Jesus is saying, I outshine all of your deities. He's saying, I outshine all of your gods. He says, those, 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 those pagan idols that you worship, they're nothing like me. Those, those planets that you worship, you know, I created those with my spoken word. The Greek gods that you idolize are just bankrupt projections of your own inner need for salvation. He says, I'm the fullest expression of your heart's desire. Church, in the ancient world, brass was the strongest known metal. So when Jesus says, my feet are like brass, he's saying, I'm unmovable. He's saying, I'm unshakable. He's saying, I'm steadfast. His description of himself here is very similar to the description we find in Daniel chapter 10. It's almost like Jesus is saying, I'm the God that Daniel saw in the Old Testament. I'm the angel that Jacob wrestled with in Genesis. I'm the one that the prophets announced that would be coming in the New Testament. And I will have my glory in Thyatira and the rest of the world. Revelation 2.19, we continue. He says, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that you are now doing more things than you did at first. Nevertheless, verse 20, I have this against you. You tolerated that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servant, servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. That starts out good for Thyatira. It starts out real strong. In fact, it would be great if Jesus came here and said, you know, Summerside Community Church, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. That would be good. But then he says, nevertheless, he says, in fact, you are so busy, you are doing more than you've ever done before. I think my caution for you is that there's a culture of programs and doing things. We must do this, this, and this, and we'll get more seats people in the seats. There is an idol of the church doing more. And I think COVID might have stepped in and made us rethink about what we do as a congregation of believers who gather together. Just like the church of Thyatira, it is possible that you get busy doing things. You get so busy doing things that the bad things or the false things begin to leak into your life and even the church. 
And in doing so, you might begin to have a compromised version of Jesus. But you see, Jesus is not handing out false compliments to this church. Jesus is actually complimenting the church. So the scary part about what we just read here is that you could run the best youth ministry program. You could volunteer at every food bank. You could come to every church function. But friends, you are defined of what you tolerate. That is what defines you. And the church of Thyatira tolerated Jezebel. The church in the West, I think, is in a real risk of tolerating Jezebel. But we call it by a different name. We tolerate celebrity culture. Where it's more important to have a platform than it is to be humble doing the small things. We tolerate the cult of influence that binds our mouths from ever telling the truth. We tolerate the sexual invasion in the name of peace. We tolerate paganism because it's popular. We tolerate emotionalism over development because it's less costly. We tolerate hidden sin while focusing on outward sin because it's easier to talk about. David Platt says this, so what's the difference between someone who willfully indulges in sexual pleasures while ignoring the Bible on moral purity and someone who willfully indulges in self-pursuit of more and more material possessions while ignoring the Bible on caring for the poor? The difference is one involves a social taboo in the church and the other involves a social norm in the church. The church in Thyatira struggled with a lot of tensions. They were accepting some things they shouldn't. They were not accepting some things they should. There was this cultural norm that you, if you wanted to be a leader, if you wanted to be liked in the community, community that you had to go to these drunken feasts. So it put them, Christians in that time were put into this tension. And we don't, church, we don't struggle as the same tension as the church did in those specific forms. But still today, we wrestle with the voice of comp compromise. And Jezebel still has her prophets. Pastor Daryl Johnson says, We still hear their voices all the time. Like this, we might hear, Look, a person needs to strike a balance in life. As though Jesus at his mighty claims could be put on the same scale with anyone or anything else. We might hear, look, I've offered loyalty to Jesus, but, so, but things just don't work that way in the real world. As though the real world does not include the real presence of Jesus Christ. What world is there that the real world in which, what world is there but the real world in which he calls us to follow him? People might say business is business and politics is politics. It is what it is, as though just saying it makes it right. Or keep your religion out of our business and politics, as though Jesus can be confined towards one sphere of life. Church, I'm begging you today, by the mercy of God, be deeply formed by this book. Be deeply formed by his spirit. Be deeply formed by God until not one area of your life hasn't been transformed by the God who so deeply loves you. This is not easy. Yes, these sayings are hard. Yes, these are uncomfortable truths. But following Jesus is not a spectator sport. He commands our allegiance and our affection. And he will not share you with another. I believe it's dangerous to pursue success in areas that don't hold true value. While excelling in good deeds, faith, love, service, community building are important. We also must recognize God's given mandate for us to confront the Jezebel spirit that seeks to intimidate the people of God. We must not align with the culture that produces chaos in our churches. 
We, not, we must not sleep with the culture because what it produces will be chaos in your life. Friends, it's not an either or, it's both and. It's too bad people subscribe to this kind of happy, clappy gospel. I just don't want to be offended. I don't want to be rattled. I just want to know how I can make more money this year than last year. How I can be more successful in life. Have we really made Jesus in the church just another stepping stone to building our own self-fulfillment? Is he just another avenue where I can build my platform bigger and better? Being careful not to offend anyone. I had a friend once tell me, I can't, uh, tell me I could, I can't see, sit under a pastor because he offends me too much. Let me tell you something. The gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive because it goes against all our human traits. It goes against everything you have learned in culture. It goes against everything in you in a world where everything revolves around yourself. Protect yourself. Promote yourself. Comfort yourself. Take care of yourself. Jesus says, no, no, no. Crucify yourself. Put aside all your self-preservation in order to live for God's glorification. No matter what that means for you in the culture around you. Church, let's keep moving into verse 21. Jesus continues in his letter. He says, I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Unless they repent of her ways, I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. There's something G.K. Chesterton once said. He who marries the spirit of the age will be widowed in the next. Friend, this is a time for unapologetic truth telling in the church. We are in desperate need of revival. But we have tolerated Jezebel when we have put our faith in a political outcome. We have tolerated Jezebel when we, have, when we refuse to allow Scripture to form the way we see cultural issues. We have tolerated Jezebel when we have made being liked more important than being faithful. So friends, why does Jesus judge Je Jezebel? So that all the churches will know that he alone is the one who searches the hearts and the minds. He continues in verse 24. Now that I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until you come. Till I come. See, Jezebel is a spirit. It's a teaching, but it's not a person. In the Old Testament, Jezebel was the wicked wife of an evil king. And any time that wicked marries evil, we're in trouble. She was a worshiper of pagan gods. And Ahab married her in direct violation of God's command to not intermarry with foreign nations. She seduced Israel into pagan idolatry, and it resulted in a campaign she spearheaded to kill the prophets of God. So, if I look at where we are today in Prince Edward Island, the spirit of Jezebel has a stronghold here to harass the people of God. So what should our response be like? I think it should be like the charge to Thyatira. Number one, we re recognize it. And number two, we refuse to tolerate it. When you tolerate it, it grows in size and in influence. Not only do we stand up for what Christ has asked us to stand up for, we stand against what Christ has commanded we stand against for. And church, I would put my money on it, that the same lying voice that same lying spirit that produces fear and compromise is trying to attack you too. They might be trying to communicate to you, trying to convince you that you're just a product of your past. 
These liars are probably trying to convince you that you should not even try to live for God because you've messed up so many times. They might be trying to convince you that you should just be a spectator, that you should just sit on the sidelines with your faith. They might be telling you that you can't lead your family. You can't lead your business. You can't be a leader in the world you live in. That you will never be like the person you are called to be. And friend, without you even knowing it, you have been seduced by a Jezebel. And we need to draw a line in the stand, sand and we need to say, you know what? I know who you were. And I know the voice of the Father. And your voice is not the voice of the Father. I believe it's time for the church on Prince Edward Island to come out of hiding. And we're not scared. We're not embarrassed. Jesus does not have a PR problem. And we're not trying to make this book more palatable. My allegiance does not stand with politics. My allegiance does not stand with business. My allegiance does not stand with the government. My allegiance does not stand with influence. My allegiance does not stand with culture. My allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the beginning. He's the end. And we must stand against the influence of Jezebel in our lives or her lies will become our truth. Amen. We're all the people of God on PEI. I'm convinced a lot of people are still hiding in, hiding because they think Jezebel killed all the prophets. We're the people that have the word like a sword in their mouths. Friends, I have good news for you. I believe God is raising up a generation that is not worried about influence is not worried about church culture, is not worried about what religious people will think. I believe he's raising up a generation that is so on fire for God that they will go anywhere, that they will say anything, and that they will stay holy unto the Lord as he is holy. If you keep reading this letter, Jesus at the end, he promises the church of Thyatira three things. Jesus says, if you remain strong... If you will confront the voices of intimidation and fear and compromise, I will give you these three things. He says, number one, I will give you victory. He says, number two, I will give you authority. And number three, this should be our favorite. I will give you the bright morning star. Do you know who the bright morning star is? It's incredible. The reward for seeking more of Jesus is Jesus. The reward of those who diligently seek him is Jesus. It's not you get some spiritual high. It's not you get, oh, I get better spiritual gifts. No, it's Jesus. You get more of Jesus. This this morning, I have this question. Who will you follow? Will you fully commit your life to follow the way of Christ? Or will you continue to indulge the ways of culture and the world? Heather, if you want to come up. Jesus is supreme. His authority is above every other authority. Scripture says his name is above every other name. In what areas of your life do you have a spirit of Jezebel telling you lies, feeding you misinformation, enhancing you to sleep with the world? There's only room for one person on the throne of your life, and that's Jesus Christ. This morning, I believe the Lord wants to set people free from carrying the spirit of Jezebel. Set them free from the lies that the enemy have been, has been feeling it. Feeding them like you're stupid, you're no good, no one will ever love you, you might as well give up. But Jesus is saying, come to me. He's saying, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He wants to give you rest this morning. He wants to show you how much he loves you this morning. 
He wants you to, to allow you to pick up victory this morning. He wants to allow you to pick up authority this morning. And ultimately, He wants you to fall more in love with the bright and morning star. And the good news is, the good news is, through the death and resurrection of the cross of, of, of Jesus, we have the opportunity to do this. It's by his blood that we become free and healed. And the good news is we don't have to do this alone. Unlike what culture tells us, you have to read this book, you have to take this course, you have to do this thing. Jesus says, come to me. He doesn't say, do this, this, and this, and this, and then come to me. He says, come to me. He'll go before you. He's going to go behind you. He'll go beside you. He's going to be with you. But he will not share you with anyone or anything. Who will you follow? So this morning, if the Lord is stirring something inside of you, where you're saying, I need to respond in some way, I think I understand that I might have a spirit of Jezebel with me telling me lies. I might be sleeping with culture while trying to keep faith that I'm a good believer. If that's you this morning, if you would like prayer, even if you would like prayer that you would just fall in love even more with the bright morning star. We have a team of people that's going to come up here in the morning to pray for you. So as Heather sings, I just want to invite you up if you want to receive prayer for something in your life this morning. Don't let it hold you back. I believe every week more and more people get set free from the bondage that is holding them down. And the good news is you're not doing it alone. So let's stand. I want to pray for all of us. And then Heather's going to play a song. And the, the ministry team can make their way forward. Don't just slip out the back door this morning. Father, you are so, so good. Father, you, you search our hearts. You search our minds. You search our spirits, Lord. And Father, I know that in order for me to pick up more of you, in order for me to fall more in love with the bright morning star, I have to let go of what I'm carrying. I have to take the authority and speak to that spirit that is telling me lies. The lies of you're no good. So Father, this morning as we are ending the service, I just pray for the courage of people that need to receive prayer this morning to come forward. And Father, those of us who don't want to receive prayer, Father, I ask that you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. So Heather's going to continue praying. You can make your way forward if you would like prayer. If not, be blessed.
Here's an altar to you. 